That's what it's like walking up and down the stairs, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. It was the Sunali <laughs> or Sunali <laughs> to my peeps over there from the same part as my mama. <laughs> um, I have an, uh, I've been asked to read something really quick. Um, and this is from, it's a treasury release. Um, and Corey's asked me to share this. It says, um, I'm sharing important tribal economic information from our federal colleagues. The Department of Treasury recently published proposed guidance regarding uh, responding to a 30-year tribal request to confirm that wholly owned tribal businesses are not subject to income tax because they generate governmental revenue. We know tribal economics are unique and businesses play an important role in the generation of governmental revenue that funds services like environmental protection. Treasury is hosting tribal consultation on December 16th, 17th, and 18th of this year. If you would like further information, please see the Treasury Office of the Tribal and Native American, I'm sorry, Tribal and Native Affairs website. That is huge. Thank you. All right. So I must may say that I am entirely impressed on the number of breathing live bodies that have open eyes. I will watch for any heads that dip and have to go to sleep, and I will try not to call upon you. It is Thursday, the last day, 8.30 in the morning, so we give you guys a pat on the back. <laughs> so if you were out playing last night, <laughs> hoo ya, <-yah>, y'all. <laughs> so welcome to my presentation. Some of you may have seen this. It's a little bit updated. I did this a few years ago. As we have... Um, as tribes, you know, we have staff changeovers that happen. We have new staff that comes in, staff that's really new to the process. We have people retiring. Look at me. I, I used to, like, years ago up here, my hair was darker. I was a little thinner. had a lot more energy, things like that. Um, and that's not tribal work that's done that to me. That's just time and age, right? Uh, but I enjoy it. I've been currently with Kashaya. So my name is, oh, I don't even have my badge. Sorry. My name is Nina Hapner. I am in here somewhere in this bag. I am the Director of Environmental Planning and Natural Resources for the Kashaya Band of Mo Indians. Uh, and so I've been around for a while. I've been there at Kashaya uh, going into 16 years. And so when you're dedicated to this, it is your career, right? I mean, we do have some people in here who have been with their tribes or working in this arena for a very long time, 16 years at Kashaya, 30 years doing this. So, and I believe in it, it's about our communities and how we build capacity and how we help them protect natural resources, their you know, water, deal with solid waste, air, indoor air, all of these components. And then sometimes you come into a program and you're like, am I ever gonna get anywhere? Because it sometimes takes time. And you don't know what to do next. And I'm going to tell you, you just got to be patient. I don't, how many of you heard Dave Lewis talk yesterday, if you were in his session? You know, Yavapai, they, took, it, they had a lot of walls for them, and he persevered. Um, and congratulations, Dick, because it, it does take time. So if you're new in your department, um, or the, the environmental director, or even in any department you're in, just if you... if if you really want to do it, do it. And if you don't, go find another happy place. That's all I got to say. Which way do I point this thing? Oh, back there. Oh, push. Right. I don't know. I think I need you to help me, Jeanette. Okay. We won't even bother with that. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a history on Kashaya. Okay. And... We started, the tribe started its planning in 98, 99. So not as early as some uh, and earlier than others. And then just because we also do marine work, we're on the coast and I just have to put in the little red, red abalone larva. <laughs> They're so cool. <laughs> um, and this is something that the tribe is, you'll see a little bit more about this because this is one of our projects as well. Go ahead. So what is ca capacity building? It's adding, you know, this is definitions, right? Adding programs to your department so you can build your programs. 
And how do you do that? And I'm going to tell you, just, just being the rear end, if any of you heard my story on Tuesday night, being the anus in the seat, <laughs> um, and you, you sit at a phone with an extension, somebody now knows that they can direct those calls to you. And that starts the process. They have somebody to talk with. And then you, a lot of us, we start with a general assistance grant. It's meant to help us build our capacity. It is a planning grant. You can do your ordinances, your solid waste, emergency plans, education material. You can do a lot of things with this. You can do solid waste stuff with this too. But do you know what the tribe wants? It's one thing to be in there, but a lot of us struggle. What does my community want? How do I get that information? And you can talk with council, but honestly, how many of you are your tribal councils totally clued in with what your community wants? Because sometimes they're overwhelmed, and they knew, they do know some, but sometimes they're overwhelmed like housing needs, or your ICWA cases, or there's so many other things going on, or if they're trying to do economic development. And so it's our job to talk with the council, but also talk with our community. Um, and some people aren't gonna talk to you. If you're not from that, if you're not a member from that tribe, <laughs> or if you're not tribal, sometimes it can be really difficult and you have to build up that trust with people. And it takes some time and just be patient. And sometimes it's like finding that one person that will help you be that, uh, be that advocate for you. Um, and it, it goes a long way. And I still, we still do that. I mean, I've been at Kashaya for 16 years and people know me, but I still look to certain people who have that in with the community. Cause honestly, there are some people who don't like me. So why? I don't know. I think I'm pretty personable, but, <laughs> but everybody has, you know, not all personalities get along with each other and it can be an, it can be informal or you can set up an assessment and no, I said not a survey. If you want to say survey and go through OMB and go that whole process, it's a sur it's not a survey. It's an assessment. It's a questionnaire or it's just informal. And then, oh, oh, she's. <laughs> um, and do you have a strategic plan? Your tribe might have one, but sometimes tribes who are taken up with so many other things, if environmental concerns really don't get onto their plate, they may not have you in their strategic plan. So it doesn't hurt to do one for yourself and your department. Where do you want to go? And having those conversations with the community can help you. And so this is where the ETEP can help you. <laughs> I, not everybody likes them, but as we heard the other day, in some cases, the person who came in um, into new at Tijon, Tijon, that helped them a lot. So take the time. It does, I mean, I'm still updating mine. Every time I think I've got it updated, something new, like, oh, I got to add that into it. But it's okay. It is a living document, and it is going to help you. All right. So sometimes, and hopefully this will play, and if you haven't seen this, I hope you enjoy it. Um, if anybody knows Mom Pa Kettle, <laughs> this is high math. And sometimes I feel this is what it this is what it feels like talking to federal agencies and state agencies. Will it play? Oh, it's not going to play. The mic. Can you play my video? Oh, dang it! It's not going to play. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Well, note it down and you can videotube it. So if you watch this video, it's about mom and pa kettle and they're talking to the gentleman from the insurance company and he's talking about math and what the numbers are and what you need. And then they start this addition process and they all get to the number 25 differently. Everybody's saying something different, but they're all getting to 25 in their own way. And sometimes that's how it's going to feel. I'm sorry it didn't play, but it's a funny little video. So your conversations might go like that though. You're talking and you think, my biggest thing is, I'm always like, we're both talking English, but we're not speaking the same language. And to just be patient, because in some, we have a, in EPA, there is a lot of new project officers under general assistance, under GAP. And in some cases, every project officer that comes on now that comes and deals with me, I am older than them. I am old enough to be their mother. And sometimes I wonder if I'm old enough to be their grandmother, and that kind of scares me. Um, but I have been around doing this a long time. And I've seen the changes. And as an older person doing this, I'm really resistant. I'm like, I don't want to do it that way. And thankfully, most of them have been pretty patient with me <laughs> as I've gradually changed and adjusted to do things the way they'd like to do them. But we do always compromise. I'm like, I'm not comfortable doing that. Can we do that? And they've really worked well with trying to find a middle ground for me. And I really appreciate that. Uh, my PO is not in here. But anybody who feels the same way, I mean, I, we do appreciate 
uh, when we get project officers that really try to see from our perspective and to help us out. Go ahead and forward it. And so what's next? Consider what you have, right? Do you only have EPA grants? Do you have BIA grants? Um, do you have any nonprofit or foundation funding? What do you have? In some cases, you may only have general assistance. And going back into your community or trying to find out what they might want, and maybe it's hard to talk to the community first if you're new, uh, and maybe you do start with tribal council. That's probably the best place to start. People will tell you eventually, we don't like that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the afterthought. Uh, but, you know, we go from there. And then how do we write grants when there's only 5% limit? Because you're in your gap grant. Because that's only really for writing your gap grant, that 5%. And so you get creative. Um, and include your elders on this. I have, I have so much information from the older people in my community. And I'll say elders, but a couple of them will tell me I'm not that old. I'm just older. So, uh, so I say the older people in my community. And they're a wealth of knowledge. And they can tell you before what they used to see, what they'd like to see, or what they'd like to see with the kids, what the kids are missing. Um, and then collaborate with others on your projects. And that might be within your tribe, or that might be outside entities where you are. And you don't, that means you don't have to write the whole grant. If somebody else will outline it for you and they say, hey, will you put in your component? Yeah, well, that's what, 0.02% of your time. So you're still under that 5%. And in some cases, make sure it, in your in your work plans, if you're going to go for certain grants that you know you can, like say if, if you're in California and you're going to apply for a Cal Recycle grant, put that in there. That's solid waste. That's totally acceptable to do. And then make connections with your resource conservation districts. You know, through in our, uh, that's what we have. I think they're the same everywhere. If they're, they work with natural uh, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. They are grant funded and they're always looking for ways to collaborate. Um, and they will outline a grant for you. <laughs> um, and just be patient, be patient. And if you are somebody who has difficulty being patient, I recommend you get up and you go for a walk around the block and then come back. Next page. And so how did we grow? These are some of the funding sources that we have. I will tell you, I love David and Lucille Packard Foundation. We had a meeting with them the other day and they're like, you know, you can use your report from another granting agency if you want, or we can just get on Zoom and have a conversation and we'll record it. I said, like, what? Who are you? you? Verbally, like I can just tell you my what we've done and it'll be okay. They're like, yeah. <sighs> Holding on to those babies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you when you deal with federal entities and state entities, everything is so arduous. Really, state of California, you need to get it together. It's like, oh, it's. I, I know this is being recorded, but honestly, my saying is like the enema you don't want on reporting for state of California. Uh, but love your money, but <laughs> the reporting process. <laughs> so, how do we grow in the beginning? Obviously, we had a pub, we did public water system grants in the seventies. In 1984, we finally got a wastewater system. We had individual septics that were overflowing and kids were playing in sewage and that needed to change, obviously. And then 98, 99 is when we got our general assistance grant. So that's really when our environmental department started. We got our first 106 in 2000. Um, drinking water set aside, first one we got was in 2016. If I'm going too fast, let me know and I will slow down. We had PPG grants, performance partnership grants. We had one in 2006 and 2008, and then we didn't have one for a long time. And then in 2017, we went ahead and went back into a PPG with our general assistance, our 106 and our 319. In 2017, we were able to receive funding from the Resource Legacy Fund, um, and we still have that funding, and that supports our marine work that we're doing, our marine monitoring work. Um, Ocean Protection Council in 2020, we got funding. We had four tribes that started what's called the Tribal Marine Stewards Network. And we sat down in a room with California Fish and Wildlife Service and Ocean Protection Council, and we wrote our grant that covered four tribes with California Indian Environmental Alliance. And we still have that, and that is funding our monitoring work, our community outreach, um, our kelp surveys, our 3D modeling, all that stuff. And we have that for three years. Um, and really working with us towards co-management in our marine resources. 
And then in 2020, we also received the David and Lucille Packard Foundation money, and we're still working with them. In 2021, we received, we were able to obtain a BIA Tribal Youth Grant, Bureau of Indian Affairs. We still have that. We use that for our Black Bear Monitoring Project with our tribal youth. And no, they don't go hunting for black bears. We put up cameras. <laughs> Um, and they go through they go through the camera feeds, and we had another black bear show up on January this year. Um, but they also get to see other wildlife that are out there on the on the lands. They do they learn how to do plant transects um, and do some habitat typing. And then in 2022, we started receiving receiving our NOAA grants for our marine work, and we still have that. So we are. We are, the tribe is embarking on an abalone farm restoration project that will also not only grow abalone, but also grow abalone to be outplanted back out into the ocean. We also have, um, it's not on there, we also, we're waiting for funding from Bureau of Indian Affairs um, under the resilience grant for our resource re, uh, recirculating system. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of stuff going on. Um, and that's, we're taking sea urchins out. So if any of you know in the ocean, the heat wave, different things, um, we have what we call urchin blooms, purple sea urchin blooms. Um, and they're very resilient, but there's also a market for food on that. So pulling those out to grow them to health. Abalone and sea urchin like the same medium. And so that will feed into us starting with growing abalone. We also have a feed project where we just completed um, with formulating feed, since there's not the kelp. Um, anyway, lots of stuff going on. Next page, sorry. And there are so many other things, as I was just talking about. So in 2009, it's when I, when I started as the director at Kashaya, there was, this, there was this brown envelope on my desk. Nothing was on it. I was like, what is this? And it just said, for environmental. And I was like, all right, well, opened it up, and huh, Caltrans, strip maps. That was the beginning of our roads division. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what to do with this. So I had to contact people, um, Cal, the guy who was doing it for Caltrans, who was a consultant. Um, it was just stuff. But it, it turned out it was pretty good funding. It's pretty flexible. And it was the first journey into dealing with the roads and the reservation. Next page. Don't disturb her. She's forwarding my slides. <laughs> So since then, I'm sorry if this is a little small, I added some stuff into this. So in 20, 000, uh, 2015, so our original rancheria, after having over 30 miles of coastline and you know 20 miles inland, we were relegated down to 41.75 acres. We're all familiar with that, right? Lose all your territory, be stuck in a small space. But in 2015, we required, we reacquired what we call the Kashaya Coastal Reserve, 678 acres, and it has a mile of coastline. Um, first time the tribe was able to get back to the ocean in over 125 years without having to ask for permission or go through state land or to own land. 2014 and 2019, we did two cow recycle grants to clean up old dumps, um, and I put that into my gap, as I said. And in 2016, we added new lands to Stewart's Point Rancheria, so another 490 acres. And then in 2016, we had our first marine ecology program with Fort Ross Conservancy, and we did this under general assistance. So you see, they get the theme here, like collaboration, 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 collaboration. You have people around you that can help you, that have um, guidance, but can help you get some of those programs started. And collaboration is great when you're a tribe with a small land base or no land base yet, but you have a community who needs things and wants things. And there are things that you can do in your territory. And I always, everything we've taken that when we've, um, like when we did stuff with Fort Ross Conservancy, their, their whole thing, if you've ever been to Fort Ross State Park, is about the Russians and when they came. Because Shia has a different view on when the Russians came. And so when we got their curriculum, we're like, Oh, I got plenty of time. <laughs> we took their stuff and we looked at it from a Kashaya point of view. And we're like, yeah, we're not talking about the Russians first. We're going to talk about us first. We are first. And we use some of our language in there to describe landscapes, what this place is. Yeah, this is on Matini. This is a village site. And what did we do here? There was salt that was collected here. There was other things. So we pulled that into their curriculum and started to adjust that with what we wanted our youth to know about their territory. 
And then in 2017, we started a youth internship program. Yay! Got kit, we, our bear project as part of that. Um, Resource Legacy Fund has helped funded some of our youth internships. Christian Christensen Fund has helped fund that, and that's getting your youth into your areas and showing them what you do and teaching them about environmental things that you do. Um, and then, as I said, 2021 OPC grant. Um, and then 2021, we also got the exchange grant, and we wrote that for under um, Clean Water Act. And I don't know about any of you, I'm sure some of you have an EN grant. I, it took me years to wrap my head around exactly how I could use that thing. It, on all, every time there was a uh, presentation on, on Exchange Network, I would go to it because I'm like, I still don't get it. I don't get it. It's like Tic Tacs. They're talking about Tic Tacs. I still think breath mint. <laughs> breath mint. Give me a breath mint. Can I have the orange ones, with, please? I really like those. Um, <laughs> and then in 2022, we have NOAA grants that we're doing for abalone work. So you see, we've, I mean, even just from 2015, like we, we've progressed a lot. And it all started because my anus was sitting in a seat, right? Or somebody else's was sitting in a seat. I know I'm going to use that word for those of you who hear that story. And if you want to hear that story after this presentation, let me know and I'll tell it to all of you. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it really, it really is about that. But, and to know, some of, some of you may be very new. Maybe you're six months, maybe you're less in where you're at. And you'll know. I always tell new people that if it is for you, you're going to know in six months to a year. And if you're still struggling after that, or you haven't at least made peace with the fact that things are gonna take some time, it might not be for you. It might not be your place. And go find your happy place, honestly. Next slide. So, and since then continued, I don't know, I won't <laughs> read all of this, I apologize. Uh, but we now do spotted owl surveys. Um, <laughs> we had a Christensen Fund representative come to us um, that wanted to, our, our tribal chair at the time said, yeah, you should come out to the Kishaya Coastal Reserve. And all of this collaboration, when people come out to your area, it can be done under GAP. That is under general assistance program. It's building capacity because you never know what funding they might have for you. She's so sweet, Daisy, she's so sweet. She comes out, I'm, I, I, get, I go out to meet her and I'm dressed in field gear and she gets out of the car and she's in a little white dress. It's all like little lacy, it's cute. She's got sandals on and I'm like, <laughs> you wanna see the tribal lands of that? <laughs> I'm like, please tell me you brought other clothes. She's like, uh, no. I was like, okay, we're going. <laughs> she toughed it out and um, kind of did a little off-roading with her, but she had total fun. And to this day, um, she's indigenous. <laughs> she, she's like, I saved that dress, Nina, just because. It reminds me. <laughs> I was like, there you go. <laughs> um, and then we started doing spotted owl surveys on the rancheria as well. So we do these to present. Um, and if you... Don't, if you, if you contract out your spotted owl surveys, your northern spotted owl surveys, you can do them yourself. You can have the, as long as you have the funds, it does take funds to do it, but that's something you, I think you can do even under um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the tribal funds. It's not hard to do, and if you find somebody, a, a good biologist that you've contracted with in the past, they know how to do them. There's protocols. It's not hard to do. And train your people. That, and, and then you train them to look. And then now they're, they're always out there. We're always looking. Always. Because you're the ones who are out on the land, not the consultant all the time. And then and we started, we now collaborate with the Greater Fairlands <clears throat> Association for our marine protected areas and our kelp surveys. We have two staff, member now that, two staff members now that are remote drone pilots. And so they have the ability to fly a remote drone. And I, if you've never taken that test, holy moly, like you have to know everything that a, a pilot has to know. I'm like, I'm just flying a little drone. Thankfully, we do not, we're not around air, their airports. So it's pretty easy for us. But um, if you, Jeremy Phillips has his, and I, I just can't imagine at Salt River Pima Maricopa, like <laughs> understanding all of that. Um, and then our tribal marine stewards program, as I mentioned, um, we, we met as a group, and that was done under GAP, and once we got funding, that shifted out of general assistance program and into the funding that we had. And um, we were like, time to throw down our tribal science and knowledge, which we've been doing with Ocean Protection Council. And as I said, the Resource Legacy Fund gives us money, uh, and we inherited that grant from admin. There's nothing like getting a grant from another department, and you're like, oh, this is mine? And what's due? Reports are due now, and how, when do I have to get them in, and how come you didn't give this to me before? 
you figure it out. You just take your time and you figure it out and call the grantor and say, hey, this is what's happened. Can I have a little extension? And usually you can. And then, of course, our, our Butika is, is a bear in Kashaya. So we have our monitoring project. And we received, my, most of them are from BIA, but we work with this with North Bear Bay, North Bay Bear Collaborative. They helped us with the grants. Again, collaboration. And they help us with the science and the data. We collect bear scat when it shows up and kids kind of get grossed out about that. But, you know, everybody poops. Um, <laughs> and we did one from Cali PA. So we, we may not do that again through Cali PA, but it, we, we were appreciative of it. Next slide. Oh, yeah. See, so much stuff. Um, you want me to read it? <laughs> Expanded muscle sampling, that's one thing that we do. We do muscle sampling and phytoplankton sampling on the Kashai Coastal Reserve. And that's where we start out with that. And we send those samples to the California Department of Public Health. And they send us results back and then we post that on an Instagram page that we have with the tribe. We are expanding that to add another site um, for muscle and phytoplankton. And then other sites that they won't add, we're going to do phytoplankton on our own, not the mussels, because that requires a different type. We'll, we'll get, eventually get to mussels, but we'll do our phytoplankton identify it in the office and then put those results out. And these are all done in places where our community gathers or collects or recreates or uses. Anybody heard of red tides? Red tide, we have a red tide. Nobody can use the beach, don't eat, don't eat shellfish, don't get in the water. Red tides, when they call a red tide, it's because there's so many spots that they just do it across the base, the board. Every time there's been a red tide down here in this area or Bodega Bay, it's not in our area, we don't have red tides. So people know that they can still go out and utilize that area. And that's important for us. And we do some 3D modeling, uh, which is of our intertidal zones. So we have two rigs. And we do a nine meter by 33 meter plot. And with high resolution cameras, we do the whole plot. We stitch between 9,000 to 13,000 photos together with a program called Agisoft and it builds a 3D model. And we can identify down to species level. And so we have five sites that we do that at. Um, and then we went, we moved from doing our ecology program at Fort Ross and now we do it on our own on the Kashaya Coastal Reserve. Um, and then we still utilize state parklands because, you know, it's Kashaya territory. So last year when we took the kids out, we let them collect salt. So, which is cool because that's what we do. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. In 2022, we received three point, we received another 3.6 million. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From OPC. Thank you very much, OPC. Uh, since then, we've added another tribe. So we now have five tribes that are part of the network. And so that's spread out among five tribes. Um, and then National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Oh, I forgot that grant. Sorry, that's another grant um, for abalone restoration work. And then NOAA, NOAA to serve more abalone and kelp and urchin restoration work. And next, I'm tired already. <laughs> Are you moving me? For oh, there we go. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, and so I just thought it'd be nice to see some pictures, right, of what we do, of, of kids out there. You see up there, Abby and Eli. Um, are sampling mussels. So you need about 20 to 30 grams, put them in the bottle, you freeze them, and then you ship them off. Um, the picture over there, that's part of our Kashai Coastal Reserve. We're cliffy. We have cliffs. <laughs> so we access our site. See, Hannah? She's one of our elders. I was so proud of her. She was so proud of herself. Um, and we went over twice with her all the gear because we, our site with climate change, we used to be able to access it just, just with a rope, access just with a rope. And um, the, not last year, but the year before, the atmospheric river that came through took off 10 feet of our coastline, totally took out our sampling site where we access the point. We get there, I just should have put that picture in. They sent me the picture and they're standing there like, it's not here. <laughs> I was like, dang it. And it's a, and this granite, it's part of this granite slab that she's going down, but there was a section to where the slope was gentle enough that you could use, it was kind of like a staircase, and you could just walk down it to the beach. And we use a rope, we brought down equipment, and then, yeah, so we had to find a new spot, and we did, but now it requires us to use climbing gear for safety. We have some young bucks, or young goats, I'll call them Kashaya goats, that just tear up and down that thing like it's nothing. Um, my knees don't work so well. It takes me a little longer. So, but it's for safety too. You know, we safety is always in mind 
We've considered having our youth do this as well, but we need to get permission from the parents. We need to make sure insurance is all up to date. Um, I will take my kids down. Like they'll, they'll totally enjoy it. But we just did a training with the rock climber that um, helped us set this up uh, on taking a kid down with you, having them hooked to you, to your daisy chains, so that you could actually go down with them. Um, or somebody who maybe is uncertain or a little scared that we could hook on with them. But this is where we go down. We do our phytoplankton. We do our muscling. We have a 3D modeling site here. So we carry carry the gear down. Um, with the kids, they are participating in the MPA. This is part of our ecology program. Um, this is uh, down below what you see Abby and Esther with the green bucket. They're doing phytoplankton sampling. We did a, um, it's called a HAPS, right? <clears throat> Training, what we're doing here with NOAA. And they had us go out at Bodega and they're like, yeah, we're gonna like go over the protocols. And so they had us on a pier on a dock and they gave us a thing and we're pulling the thing along. We're all laughing. We're like, well, if only our sampling was like this. <laughs> and they're like, it's not. I'm like, no, we have to do bucket pour overs. Like we're rocky and cliffy and there's, that doesn't happen. If we wanna get washed out to the ocean, yeah, <laughs> we can do that. So we had to show them what we do and they're like, oh yeah, we'll change protocols. Like, yeah, that's not, None of us have that simplicity for taking a sample. So as you can see, this photo over here, we're, wait, does it have a pointer? I don't know. Um, this one here is with our poles and our rigs. We're doing a 3D modeling. And then down below with the tree, the kids are setting up a game camera. So uh, next slide. Oh. And when those little larvae grow, they become this little guy in the corner. And they're so yummy. Like, who thought I would like to eat snails? But I do love, I like this snail a lot. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you have any questions or, or you know. Um, <laughs> you can raise your hand. You can ask. Are you still asleep? Yes. So we don't have the gray structure yet for the abalone. We're in pro that's a process. Um, and so we work a lot with Bodega Marine Lab. And that's where we housed the abalone that we were doing on our feed project. Um, and then we are currently in the process of, we have an area that we're working with uh, on a lease to do um, containers actually for the recirculating system for urchins. And if that works out, then we'll be able to do abalone in that as well and potentially kelp. So, and we did the mill feed. We use grape mill, we use the grape um, leavings. It's actually pretty nutritious. And so working with Moss Landing, they helped formulate some meal feeds that we fed to the abalone. And then we had a taste testing, uh, taste testing, test, taste testing. Mm. We had an event where Hog Island prepared the abalone under different meal feeds and had people sample them. Uh, and interestingly enough, our elders and those who have always eaten kelp that have fed on seaweed or, or kelp have uh, abalone. I think I said that all wrong. Our elders who have always had abalone that have eaten kelp, when they went and they they did the taste test, those were the ones that they chose, were the ones that were fed on the kelp pellets, which was interesting. So they have a certain, you know, definitely have a taste preference. But yeah, so we've been working with Bodega Marine Labs on that. Another question? Yeah. Oh, I don't know who's first. Sorry. Um, it's, it's a combo question, but I saw federal, state, nonprofit, and foundation funding. Mm -hmm. How do you manage all of that? Do you have like a grant writer in house with the department or do you have to go through the tribe? So like, how do you do it and how would you wish to do it for other folks who might try to like go that path? So in the beginning, in the beginning, there was no grant manager. <laughs> in the beginning, it was all my department. <laughs> we now have a grant manager who is on staff uh, and it has taken me a little bit of time to adjust to having a grant manager. I'm starting to like it a lot, but it's that, you know, when you're older and you've had to do it all yourself for forever, you're like, oh, I have to what? I have to copy you on everything and you want to see everything and you want access to my files? Like, what? And now I'm like, oh yeah, sure. Help me out. Help keep me on track. So if you have a grant manager, they can be really useful and really helpful. And I'm finding that out. We all did it on ourselves. Um, we did periodically would hire somebody to help us write grants. So a consultant who would help. And we still have that person actually on board. But having a grant manager is proving to be a huge boon. It really helps. And I 
but it also frees me up to do all a whole lot of other things. And so when somebody says, Nina, can you write your own grant? I'm like, I don't have time. Um, I, I've not calculated that time into what I do. So it's, it's a bit of a struggle, but I'm learning. I'm learning to adjust. Yes. Was there another question? Right here. This oh, okay. Um, how many people do you have and how many people do you wish you had? So in the beginning, I only had two. <laughs> <laughs> I now have 11 staff. And so that's a lot. Timesheets are murder. That's all I have to say. <laughs> They're murder. And I have staff that are up at the Rancheria, which is out on the coast because our tribal office is in Santa Rosa. So Fridays before timesheets, I head to the Rancheria, which is, it takes us an hour and a half to go 65 miles because we go over the coastal mountains and I spend the time there and I do their timesheets and then I bring them down and oh my, that's so much easier. But yeah, it's, um, it helps to have 11. I would, I could use five more, but I also need the office space. And that is something that has limited us in the past is like people, if the tribe wants you to apply for all of these grants, you're like, that's great. Where am I going to put their anuses, right? Their butts, where am I going to put them? Because if you don't, I mean, resources, resources are not just money resources. Resources are also people resources and the infrastructure resource. And you have to be creative. We finally, um, Abby is like my right-hand person. Like if she ever leaves, I'm going to cry and, and be so sad. And you may not see me forever. She's, and she's a, one of those people that I like, I protect. <laughs> I was like, I don't want you to go anywhere, Abby. Um, but we, one day we're like, what are we going to do? We're out of space. Every, we had the back part of the admin office. And every time we clear off a table, like our lab, our inside lab, people would come and set paperwork and everything on it. And we're like, I need this space. And so finally one of our other divisions, they were closing it, our offices opened up and we just did it. We just, we did it, but it moved us out of the admin office. And so what we had to consider was that now our rent was not covered under our indirect costs. We were not in the same room as the admin. And I had conversations with EPA on this, like, okay, so is this okay? And they're like, yeah, but you know, you have to do it as a direct line item. So there are things, it's always something to consider if you're out of that main admin office or not on the reservation. If we were on the reservation, it'd still be okay, but we're not, we're in town. And so we have to line item our rent, our internet, our security, like all of that stuff has to be line item. And that comes out of your grants. And so I have to put that in all of my grants. Yes. Hi. Um, I saw that you you had listed like that you had a public water system grant in the mm -hmm. 70s, and then that was before the GAP grant, before your environmental department started. So how did that work? Like, was the public water so that's for just drinking water? Was that run by? Was that just EPA direct implementation? Actually, JF Kennedy he came up to visit Kashaya, and people went and got buckets of water because they did not have running water. And that was in the late fifties, right? Early sixties, JFK came up and visited. Um, and he's like, you guys don't have water. He's like, you're in California. He's like, no, we don't have water. Um, within 10 years of that is how we got a public water or a drinking water system. It wasn't necessarily public water at the time, but we got a drinking water system because we didn't have one. Um, and then that also moved into then getting the septic systems. Yeah, so it was all, it was through the Indian Health Service that we were able to get some of that. He advocated for the tribe to get water. Wow, that's great. Hi, thanks for this. Um, can you speak a little more to ongoing needs assessments and strategic planning and how that helps you identify grants or build more collaborations? <laughs> it never stops. And so that I'm always on the outlook, even coming here, like, I, honestly, I didn't get to do a whole lot of sessions, but I met a lot of people um, just talking with them. And it is every time. Uh, so strategically, ETEP, I, I always like, okay, we're done with this. Oh, no, now we have to do something else. I have utilized um, California Tribal Epidemiology Center as well. So every state has a tribal epidemiology center. Um, but not all housed in the same, like ours is housed with California Indian Rural Health Board. Uh, and we use them because they can also help us with our IRBs, our internal review boards. And then I can do a survey, but they have actually helped us like with funding or sponsoring us so we can do assessments in our community. So I would, that was, that smells like it's burning. <laughs> hmm. 
well, if I light up in flames, I guess I'm going out in a flame of fire. Um, and so definitely utilizing who is around you, like who works with the tribe. Um, and so for us, California, you know, that California Tribal Epidemiology Center, CTEC, uh, um, they're one. They can help with funding. And then we do a lot. We try to, on like a quarterly basis, have a meeting with their community or put questions out like on Instagram. Everybody is on social media, social network. And if you put something on there, they're going to respond usually. What do you want? What do you want to see? It's gotten harder for us to get people in person, even with food. They just, there has to be something bigger. We've gone to gift cards. And honestly, Gen EPA needs to consider ways to help tribes to get more community involvement. They like the swag, but they really, hard times are hard. Where we're at, where the tribe is, if they go up to Wallala, um, a dozen eggs cost them 15 bucks. Bread costs you $10. Giving them a gift card for 25 means they can get at least bread, eggs, and milk. Um, and so really considering like what we can utilize with our communities to get them to come in. Food is great, but they also need to be able to put food on their table for their people, especially if we're out on the reservation. And so we tried to do that with them in a lot of informal talks. I'll stop people like, what do you want? What do you want to see? You know, and sometimes I get the whole earful. I'm like, okay, let me write that down and let's try to address it. Right now we have a dog issue. I can't really do that under EPA. I used to be able to do that under GAP, but I can't do that anymore. And so trying to find creative ways to deal with a dog issue. We have one house that has 15 dogs and they pack up. They, they go around killing dogs that are tied up on their leads. I can't do that under EPA. We don't have money in other places. Like it's a struggle. It's a struggle. So, but I know that's what they need. Um, and I work on it a little bit here and there, but it's really, it's hard. It's hard, but you just, you, I always look for opportunities because I never know where they're going to come from. And sometimes I have to be careful because I have a lot of work on my plate and I am behind on stuff and I don't have enough staff. Those five other staff, I would, I talking to uh, Ron Sumberg and he's like, yeah, we do this all under Swiffer. I'm like, Oh, I need to apply for Swiffer grant. <laughs> I just haven't cause I didn't have the resources, but now I do. So that's, I mean, I don't know if that really answers your questions, but it's always being vigilant, always like looking for the opportunity and I'm constantly updating my ETEP. I'm sure EPA would like to have my final one eventually, but <clears throat> still an update process. It's a living document. It's a living document. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, not a question, but it's something, some information for you. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the uh, Office of Tribal Leases, uh, Section 105 uh, lease agreement to get reimbursed for le um, re uh, facility costs. Um, if mm. you need, so if you need to expand your facilities, that goes for all tribes. Uh, it's yeah, through the Office of Tribal Leases, BIA. Um, and they have a reimbursement program where you can either buy a facility or rent out a facility. And it doesn't have to be on the reservation. No, it could oh, be anywhere. Oh, dude, you better send me um, that information. Yeah, I'll send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> you better share that with everybody who needs more infrastructure. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Dogs. <sighs> Dogs and cats. Oh, my gosh. All right, no other questions? Okay, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes, all right. Who was not at the storytelling? You wanna hear my story about dogs and coyotes? All right, and this is being recorded, so lots of people. I don't care, people online, you share it, whatever. And this has helped me, and I tell this story sometimes when things get a little contentious. So a long, long time ago, coyote and dogs, they used to hang out, do things together, go to meetings together, spend time together. A coyote is coyote, and coyote sometimes is naughty, sometimes pulls pranks, and the dogs would get upset with him. Like, coyote, why do you do that? Why do you do that? You know it upsets us. He's like, I can't help it. I'm coyote. If you keep doing it, coyote, you are not, you're not going to be allowed to hang out with us anymore. It's just not going to happen. And he's like, oh, come on, come on. Happened again. Coyote just couldn't resist. And dog's like, that's it. No more. The coyote's like, fine, fine. But he knew, he waited and he planned. The dogs were gonna have a meeting. And he waited until that meeting came and the dogs go to the round house, uh, the long house. <clears throat> and before they go in, they take off their anus and they hang it on the line. Every dog, before they go in, then to the meeting, they take off their anus and they hang it on the line. Take off their anus and they hang it on the line. Coyote waited for that last dog to go in, taking off their anus and hanging it on the line. And waited till the meeting was well under the way. 
And then he had taken all the brush that he had put up around the longhouse and he lit it so it smoked really bad into the building. And oh my gosh, the dogs panicked. Tables were getting turned over, chairs were getting turned over, and they were running around, headed for the door. And as they went out the door, they were grabbing an anus and putting it on and grabbing an anus and putting it on and grabbing an anus and putting it on until the last dog came out, took off the anus and put it on. And Coyote's just laughing. And the dog's like, oh, I don't have my anus, I have somebody else's. <laughs> and so now when dogs see each other, they're like, do you have my anus? It's when they're sniffing each other's rear ends, right? <laughs> and what does it say if they go and they sniff you as a person, they're sniffing your rear end. Maybe they think you're one of the dogs and you have their anus. Made you all laugh. <laughs> and there's morals to that story. I mean, be careful who you upset. You never know how, you know, what your dealings will be with them in the future or how they're going to retaliate. And don't panic. When you panic, you, you can lose we're recording, okay, you can lose your, lose your rear end. And then you'll be trying to fix mistakes for a very long time that you may not be able to fix. So, thanks. Or you got three minutes, you can go have some fruit, whatever's out there, coffee. Yes. Hi, thanks for that. I am part of a program that can't give out funding, but I really want to help tribes, support tribes to do the amazing work you do, mm -hmm. build capacity. What does support look like in situations like that for you? Support can be technical assistance. That's huge. Sometimes as we're building our capacity, we don't have the technical abilities yet. And a lot of times I look for trainings that I can build that capacity within my staff. Like if you can train, if there's something that you offer that we can do ourselves, and you can help train us, I'll, I'll take it. 